Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for attending today's webinar, eBooking, It Can Work for Your Practice Too. My name is Cassie Fraser and I'm the Program Director for Consumer Health and Innovation here at Canada Health InfoWay. Joining me on the line from Montreal is Marie-Claude Trudel, an Associate Professor in the Department of Information Technologies at HEC Montreal. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping points I would like to review. This session will be recorded and we may post it on InfoWay's website for future use. If you would like to ask a question, please use the question and answer feature. The moderator will pose the question on your behalf and your name will not be used. Please note this disclaimer. This webinar is intended to be informational only and represents solely the views of InfoWay. InfoWay does not endorse any particular technology, solution, or vendor or guarantee results related to the use of such technologies. To ask questions, look at the toolbar at the top of your screen and click the drop down arrow to select question and answer or Q&A. Ensure that the question is sent to all panelists. Let's begin. In today's presentation, I will first speak to the value and benefits of e-booking, then Marie-Claude will share the results and lessons learned from the e-booking benefits evaluation study, which was conducted in six primary care practices in Quebec. I will then address some of the common challenges and concerns that we've heard from clinicians and practices, and we hope to end with enough time for some of your questions. You can feel free to send them in along uh, the presentation. You don't have to save them until the end. So what is e-booking? Well, InfoWay has defined e-booking as the ability for a patient to book an appointment electronically, online or through a mobile device, by choosing a date and time, booking the appointment, and receiving electronic confirmation without interacting with another person. Ideally, the solution will also facilitate the use of automated alerts or reminders. As we consider opportunities for e-booking uptake, it's helpful for us to consider consumer demand. We know that Canadians are ready for change. The latest Canadian survey research indicates that 89% of us feel it's important to personally have full advantage of digital health tools and capabilities. And 90% of us who access our own health information online describe this experience as positive. When we look specifically at the desire to use e-booking, the research indicates that nearly 90% of Canadians want to be able to electronically book an appointment with their health care provider if they were given the chance. And in fact, Canadians also ranked e-booking in the top three most useful useful online consumer health services just behind electronic prescription renewals and viewing their lab results online. However, the latest Commonwealth Fund data, which is from 2012, shows that the proportion of practices in Canada offering e-booking is about four times higher in the United States than in Canada and almost ten times higher in Sweden. While this is a 2012 data point, it will be interesting to see how the value changes when the 2015 survey is actually rolled out. We're fairly behind the other countries. However, access is slowly growing, so despite enjoying this convenience and access in other areas of our life, like travel or banking, the number of us that can actually e-book an appointment with their care provider remains quite limited. Consumer research data shows that in 2013, only 5% of Canadians had access to online appointment booking with their primary care provider, although in 2014, this number did increase to about 7%. Interestingly, this figure jumps to a 10% access when you consider the ability to book with other healthcare providers, like physio, occupational therapy, dentist, etc. We hope that the e-booking initiative will further increase this capacity, but for the moment, it seems that we still have some room to grow. Your interest and efforts in making e-booking available to Canadians will certainly help in making this change. So why did Canada Health InfoWay offer an e-booking initiative? Well, as already stated, we know that Canadians want to electronically book appointments online with their healthcare provider at the time and in the place that's convenient to them. Similarly, through our key informant interviews and other research, we know that clinicians want to offer these services to their patients. They see it as the right thing to do and the next step. Furthermore, we know that there are benefits which can accrue to all, for patients, for clinicians, and for clinic staff. Research suggests it's a win-win-win situation once you get started. InfoWay wants to assist clinicians and practices in the implementation of e-booking solutions so that their patients, Canadians, can have the desired electronic access they enjoy in other areas of life. 
The initiative is structured to provide eligible licensed medical physicians and nurse practitioners who are new implementers of the e-booking technology with a subsidy to partially offset their costs related to implementing it, as well as for participating in our initiative. The grant is payable to an individual clinician or a group practice upon the achievement of specific milestones. To better understand the e-booking landscape, InfoWay has gathered evidence around the perspectives, perspectives and experiences of patients, clinicians, administrators, and vendors. We found that the e-booking marketplace is evolving and that the available solutions can vary in terms of functionality. That said, there are some common features across the majority of solutions, which include 24-7 appointment scheduling, automated appointment confirmation, secure access, automated appointment reminders, individual staff logins, customizable scheduling rules, and multiple appointment types. Some solutions also offer these additional features, such as appointment integration with a patient's personal calendar, automated cancellation notice or rescheduling options, text options, waitlist creation, and integration with mobile devices. <clears throat> so now we'll spend a few moments looking at the value and benefits of e-booking. Early adopters have consistently reported clear and straightforward benefits of e-booking for the provider, administrative staff, and the patient. For instance, interviews with e-booking adopters in Canada have highlighted provider benefits such as reduction in no-shows, increased ability for patients to cancel and rebook appointments themselves, gains in administrative staff efficiency and satisfaction, as well as improved patient empowerment and satisfaction. These reports were further supported by evidence in the international literature, so all the data seems to be corroborating nicely. Looking at each of these a little more closely, productivity gains seem to be achieved through a reduction in no-shows as well as time savings generated at time of appointment booking. For no-shows, providers in their clinics can experience reductions in no-shows and last-minute appointment cancellations, better replacement of cancelled spots, and optimization of schedules with fewer gaps in a day. One clinic in BC noted that e-booking reduced no-show appointments from 13% to 3.8% of all of their appointments a sentiment that was echoed by other early adopter practices. When patients fail to arrive for scheduled appointments, it not only interrupts the flow of patient care, but it also hurts clinic productivity and potentially revenue if the appointments cannot be easily filled by same-day appointments. From a time savings perspective, in addition to eliminating backlogs and other time-consuming tasks for staff related to triaging patients at time of appointment booking, a study in Alberta showed an 80% reduction in the time required to set up a single appointment by providing online scheduling tools. For staff and provider convenience, staff are able to reallocate their time and focus on higher value tasks, increasing their satisfaction. And features of the solution like individual staff logins, the customizable scheduling rules, multiple appointment types, all help providers and practices to maintain control of their schedule. And of course, in considering patient convenience and satisfaction, the fact that you can book an appointment 24-7 is very convenient, and the fact that you get an appointment confirmation immediately um, confirms that you, you have care and access to care when you need it. The automated reminders and alerts helps us all in our busy days and schedules to remember where we're actually supposed to be and when. Our research also suggests that e-booking solutions are quite affordable. Some electronic medical records may include e-booking as part of a suite of services at no extra cost, while other solutions use standalone booking solutions, some of which can cost as little as $20 a month for a solo user or up to $40 a month for a number of clinicians. There may also be some additional fees for items like reminder notifications, which may not be part of the setup fee or original monthly cost. I wanted to also share a few of the anecdotes that we heard from our key informant interviews. For some early adopters, the key motivator for e-booking is improving the patient experience. For example, a clinician in Montreal noted that his group offered the e-booking functionality to put the patients in the driver's seat, to give patients a little more power. It was to provide easier access to the clinic and make it easier for patients to schedule appointments. Another clinician in Ontario shared that, we hear it's difficult to make appointments. The long wait times, it's not a pleasant experience. So anything we can do to reduce that, letting patients have more control over that in an online manner is a welcome advantage. An administrative staff member working at a specialist practice also reported that e-booking had absolutely reduced no-shows and last-minute cancellations in their practice. And another medical office assistant shared, 
I think the automated email and phone call reminders, that for me is priceless. That's worth all the money in the world. The fact that I don't have to sit here and reschedule 250 patients when the doctor is away for a week, that's a lot. Anecdotes from early adopters combined with survey data and literature reviews all seem to suggest that there's real value and benefits to be achieved through the implementation and use of e-booking. I'd now like to turn the floor over to Marie Claude so that she may share the findings from their research study. Marie Claude, over to you. Thank you very much, Cassie. Um, so I'm the one presenting today, but our research team is composed of Guy Paré, Research Chair in IT and Healthcare at HEC Montreal, and also Pascal Forget, Assistant Professor at Université du Québec at Trois-Rivières. I'm very happy to present our findings about the adoption, usage, and impacts of e-booking systems in medical practices. Okay, so this research was founded by Canada Health Info Way and the CIFRIO, and it was conducted in six private medical clinics with different patient profiles, all adopting the same e-booking system, which was drdirect.com, abbreviated as DDI. So here you see the different clinics we visited. Most of them were general medicine clinics with or without specialists or walk-in clinics. One clinic, Clinic C, was a specialized center. And Clinic E was associated to a tech company who was only providing services to their employees and immediate family. The e-booking system we studied is basically a secure web portal where patients can access their doctor's schedule 24-7 and book an appointment without the assistance of a secretary. The patient can also modify confirm or cancel the appointment online. Two reminders are sent automatically by the system. The first one is an email reminder five days prior to the appointment, and the second one is an automated telephone reminder two days before the appointment. Whenever a patient is not successfully reached after three automated phone calls, the secretary tries to call the patient the day prior to the appointment to confirm. The system can also track information about no-shows, repeated offenders, and also new patients. The DDI solution was chosen for this study because of its interoperability with the KinLogix electronic medical record system, which was the most widely used EMR in medical clinics in Quebec at the time. So our research had three objectives. First, we wanted to evaluate the impact of different marketing strategies on adoption rates. Second, we wanted to measure the benefits perceived by patients after they have used an e-booking system, as well as their intention to continue using it in the future. And finally, we wanted to measure the impact of the e-booking system on no-show rates in each medical clinic. So in order to evaluate the impact of marketing strategies, we first had to get statistics about patient adoption, essentially when they registered to the system, as well as patient usage, if and or when they actually made an appointment online using the system. GDI gave us the web access to their report engine, so we were able to get these numbers easily just by querying the system. Our study was conducted between January 2012 and the end of November 2013. As you can see, both Clinic A and B had implemented the system before our study, 2009 for Clinic A and in 2010 for Clinic B. So as of December 31st, 2011, they had a head start of 1,810 patients for A and 2,258 patients for B. The four other clinics implemented their e-booking system in 2012, although not necessarily in January. The number of av availabilities or time slots put online by doctors were on the rise for all clinics except at Clinic A. However, this clinic did not have an EMR and chose to manage 100% of its schedule using DDI, even for the appointments made by the secretary. These appointments would later be tracked as offline appointments. Therefore, this uh, decreasing slope 
could possibly reflect their functioning with one less doctor in 2013. The number of appointments made online were also on the rise for most clinics, clinic E and F being stagnant. What's more interesting on the next slide is that you can see the proportion, the number of appointments made online divided by the numbers of availabilities put online. So clinic B seems to be quite successful here, with almost 84% of their online availabilities actually booked online by patients. The other results are more disappointing, though, especially Clinic C, who showed steep rises on the two previous graphs, and Clinic A, who puts all of uh, the availabilities online, but whose staff still have to manage more than 70% of them manually. So in order to make sense of these stats, we conducted a web survey in spring 2013. Our base sample was the 1,032 patients who explicitly agreed to be contacted by our research team when they registered to DDI in the first place. From those, we received 304 complete and usable questionnaires. So quickly here, we see that some marketing strategies were used pretty much everywhere, whereas some were specific to certain clinics. On-site verbal notifications by secretaries, receptionists, and physicians were common to all, as well as asking the patients to book online via the clinic's phone system. From this, we clearly see that the main motivator for patients to enroll in the system was the recommendation of the secretary during an earlier visit to the clinic. Half of the patient mentioned they were influenced by the strategy. Verbal recommendations from treating physicians come second with 20%. The voicemail message and the banner or tab on the website both motivated approximately 15% of the patients, and the other strategies had marginal effects. Among our 304 respondents, 61 were registered but had never booked an appointment at the time they did our survey. When asked about this, the most common answer they provided was because they did not have to, they did not need to see a doctor, which is a pretty good reason when you think about it. The two following reasons are more problematic as 34% tried but found no availabilities for their doctor, and 23% tried but encountered technical problems that made them quit. Now about our second objective, perceived benefits. Overall, the perception of the e-booking system is quite positive, as you can see here. The most important benefits, though, are related to flexibility, as patients could see several availabilities before choosing one, and they could do that whenever they wanted, even in the middle of the night. Time savings were also important. The elimination of wait time, constantly having to redial the clinic's number, or even having to go in person to the clinic. Finally, some mentioned the system would allow them not to forget their appointment because of the reminders and thought this was a benefit. Finally, about our third objective, the no-shows. As I said earlier, 100% of the availabilities at Clinic A were managed with the system, so it was easy to track the no-shows there. On this graph, the blue line corresponds to the appointments made online, whereas the red line corresponds to the appointments made offline. Actually, it corresponds to the no-shows related to the online appointments, and the red line corresponds to the no-shows related to the appointments made offline. So you see that the no-shows related to online is a lot less than the no-shows related to the offline appointments. On the next slide, we see the numbers for all the clinics, where the numbers of no-shows for appointments made online is a lot lower than the no-shows for appointments made offline. All these tests were statistically significant. Now for the takeaways. 
first, and this is important, not, not all appointments are equal. Some doctors don't want to put their availabilities online as they trust their secretary to filter the request and appoint the patient to a time slot that will be consistent with the nature of the problem and or the patient condition. This is important. Pop-up filters can be developed and provided as a solution. But unfortunately, patients can always provide false information in, in answering the questions, intentionally or not. Ultimately, a better integration with the clinic's EMR would allow the system to consider the patient profile before offering availability. Hence, it would become somewhat of an expert system. Second, verbal recommendations have the most impact. This is also important. Patients who registered did so in majority because their doctor or doctor's secretary recommended them the system. So these people must continue to do so on a daily basis. Yet considering the result of our survey when promoting the system, we think we sh they should put the emphasis on its benefits like flexibility rather than on its characteristics at this as this, does not, as this did not seem to matter much. Remember, ease of use earlier was rated 4.3 on a five-point scale, so technically there seems to be no problem with this system, um, and uh, flexibility would be most important to, uh, pro to promote. Finally, health services consumption is not hedonic. People may have registered if they don't need to see a doctor, they will not use the system and may very well forget about it. And again, this is fine. The clinic could periodically send an email to the registered patient and remind them about the system. These emails could clearly indicate how to retrieve forgotten username and password to alleviate the burden of searching for it. We all know this is not interesting and fun to do. In order not to feel like unsolicited messages, these emails could be coupled with educational material, promoting self-care, or even public health issues. So that's it for me. I thank you all for your attention. That's great. Thanks, Marie Claude. The, the results that you just shared are really interesting, and I hope the takeaways in particular will be insightful for others who are considering how to implement e-booking or how to optimize its use within their practice. There's certainly some points of note there. Uh, now I wanted to bring to light just some of the common challenges that uh, we heard or some of the concerns we heard when we were uh, doing our research and um, talking to um, early adopters or those that were thinking about it but were a bit worried to go ahead. Uh, so one of the common questions we had was, how can I make sure I don't lose control of my schedule? Well, we know that e-booking solutions often have robust filtering options that direct patients to choose the correct clinician for the correct amount of time for the correct appointment type. Even if the patient makes a mistake or the clinician desires a change, with most e-booking solutions, the patient can be notified automatically and can reschedule appropriately. Early adopters reported that the clinic does not give up control of the schedule, but merely the burden of filling it. Doesn't this open up my schedule to abuse? What if patients book up my whole schedule? A number of early adopters of e-booking described e-booking as a privilege that clinics afford their patients. If it's abused, they noted, it can be taken away. However, none of the adopters we spoke to had experienced overuse of the e-booking by patients. It was quite respectful. And none worried that they would not be able to respond to it if it did occur. Most of the solutions also allow for rules to be built into the system too, which help further to guide the patient's use. Some of my patients won't use a computer to book an appointment. While we understand this concern, research suggests that consumer use of online tools is rapidly increasing for all ages and demographics. In fact, Canadians are leading the pack in terms of online engagement and survey data reflects that 70% of patients aged 55 years and older are interested in being able to make an appointment with their health care provider electronically. This is equivalent to the percentage of patients in the age grouping of 35 to 54 and 18 to 34. Likewise, Canadian market data shows that three out of four Canadians now own smartphones, well above the rates of use in the United States and other developed markets. And while income does seem to play a role in the levels of mobile access, 
51% of people with an annual income less than $20,000 have access to a smartphone or a feature phone and indicated they would be most likely able to make an appointment and interested in making an appointment with their healthcare provider electronically if given the chance. And we'd like to point out too that phone, the phone can still remain available for those that are not able to book online or interested in booking online. And in fact, the access to that becomes freed up and it's easier at that point as well. I have some appointment slots in my schedule that I don't want people to book online. Well, e-booking schedules can be customizable. If a clinic wishes to reserve afternoon appointments for walk-ins, for example, or every Wednesday morning for uh, annual checkups, staff can make those appointment slots unavailable for online booking or only available for particular types of appointments. My secretary or my medical office assistant is concerned about their job security. The MOA role or secretary front desk staff role is highly valued and necessary in most practices. For those practices who are not yet e-booking, managing the phones comprises a large part of the time spent by someone at the front desk. Their perspective and input is critical in determining the new workflow when implementing an e-booking solution. And while it cannot be expected that all patients in the practice will automatically move over to using online booking tools, a significant portion are likely to adopt, which alleviates the pressure on that person to answer multiple phone lines at one time and allows them to be able to more appropriately deal with the patients in front of them or on the phone, feel like they're providing better quality care, and reallocate their time to getting on with other higher valued tasks that also derive more satisfaction for them and for the practice. We also heard in Marie Claude's presentation that the MOA has a large role to play in patient adoption of the e-booking solutions. By having them simply remind the patient or invite them to e-book online, the word of mouth referral goes a long way to seeing that translate into actual action or response by the patient. And finally, when we brought this specific concern forward to our early adopter interviewees, none of them reported losing staff because of e-booking. Some mentioned that they were able to avoid hiring additional staff to deal with the volume, and most noted there was a reduction in phone lines or other um, office administrative tools that helped um, and they also noted that there was an easing in the atmosphere of the clinic. So when the patient walked in the door, things just seemed quite uh, calmer and it had less buzz and, and franticness about it right from the moment the patient walked in, which changed the atmosphere and the level of interaction with the patient when they actually got into the position. <clears throat> so finally, another question, how do I get started? And I won't go in detail over all of these. We'll be making the slides available um, as well as the recording after uh, this presentation concludes. Um, but in thinking about it, one of the most important things for a practice is, is to determine what their business requirements are. You need to consider your business needs. And if you're wondering, like, what are all the aspects I should consider even, uh, maybe thinking about some of the commonly available functionalities that we noted uh, would be a great way to get started and ask, you know, are these useful for me? Are they necessary in my practice? Which ones of these are a priority and necessary for me? And you've got to look at the full context of your practice. How many clinicians are there? What types of clinicians are there? Are unique scheduling ru rules required for each one or does everybody practice in the same manner? Do you need individual staff logins? That kind of thing. Once your business requirements are understood and prioritized so you know which ones are mandatory that are a deal breaker for you, um, you can go about um, connecting with vendors and looking at available solutions. You want to make sure that the solution that you select meets your prioritized business requirements. You also want to remember to consider privacy and security impacts to make sure that your information and the patient's information is secure. And then also thinking about what kind of training and implementation support can you get and ongoing support after the e-booking solution has gone live. What can the vendor provide for you? So those are all important things to consider as you're making your decision. At the same time, you also want to get yourself ready. You kind of need to do a bit of a readiness assessment. And we have a few tools available on our e-booking site to help you with this. Um, for example, we have our change management tips before you launch document to help you think about, you know, what are your training needs? What are the scheduling rules you might want? How are you going to introduce this to patients? How are you going to sustain communications and provide support for lost passwords or that kind of thing? You also want to conduct a workflow analysis. How do you work now? How will you work in the future? Who's still going to answer the phone? Or how is uh, an online appointment going to be booked as well as an in-person appointment going to be booked? You want to make sure all roles and responsibilities are covered off. 
And if you're not comfortable or familiar with doing a workflow assessment, we have a sample one on our website for you um, that you can leverage and tweak to make it fit your own needs. And then once you get going, it's important to think about you know, how you're going to optimize the solution to, best, uh, to get the best gain and value for your practice as well as for your patients. So we know some practices that may be a little bit more nervous as they get started may only make you know, 10 to 20% of their uh, potential appointments available in an online booking capacity. But once you get going and you get comfortable with the workflow and you work out the kinks, it's important to go back and revisit that to make sure that you have a sufficient volume of appointments available online. As Marie Claude's data showed, you need to have the appointments there for a patient to be able to book if you want them to come back and keep using it and to uh, get the benefits. So we have some tips after you launch in a resource document that's also available for you. So that's pretty much it for the presentation. I hope that you found it valuable to this point and you understand you know, why e-booking can make sense and work in your practice too. There's a lot of value and benefits to be gained for patients, providers, and clinics and clinic staff, um, and you know, we have real life uh, evidence from Marie Claude's presentation to show that it is playing out on the front lines. Uh, so we'd like to turn it over to you and ask you if you have any questions. I'll just take a moment here to read the first one that's come in. Uh, so the first question, it's a very good one, thank you, is asking, is there any confusion uh, when we say that, that there's 24-7 appointment scheduling? Um, are the patients interpreting this that they can actually get an appointment 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Um, we haven't um, run into that at all or heard that anecdote yet, and I think it's um, probably a matter of how you communicate the message. That you know, this is more of um, something that we would tend to promote as you're thinking about a solution and thinking about the patient access and convenience that they can use the online tool 24 hours or seven days a week, but you know, the a clinic is still open during its normal hours of service and the appointments that would then pop up um, would be within those lines as well. So I think choosing your messaging carefully and your marketing and communications materials would help to alleviate that, but we haven't heard any concerns in that way. Thank you for if the I question. Oh, sorry, Marie Claude, do you want to add to that? Well, just because it's, it's funny that, it's interesting that question because we had Somewhat of a problem with that when we were um, anal analyzing our data yeah, and uh, just uh, communication problems when we were talking to the programmers uh, want, because we wanted some information and um, mm -hmm. you need to be very specific when you ask questions such as uh, when did this uh, appointment was made, uh, when was the appointment actually made. What is making the appointment? And so at one point we decided to, um, to uh, talk about buy versus delivery. And I think that 24-7 here is the buying of the service, not the delivery of the service. So you need to find a way to, to promote that to, to the, the, um, the customers. I mean, it's the, the buying of the, you can buy something on the website 24-7 yet it will be delivered to you probably on a weekday between 9 to 5. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing with, this appointment, with these appointments. You make an appointment 24-7, yet you attend appointments on a regular um, schedule. Yeah, so for us, the buy versus delivery was the way we found to make sure that we were talking about exactly the same thing. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a really valid point, and thank you for adding that added uh, element to it. I think um, some of the materials I've seen have, have been worded more like, um, you know, to the patients, like, you know, you can now book appointments online at a time that's, you know, or access at a time that's convenient for you kind of thing. Um, but they stay, stay away sort of from the 24-7 sort of wording. Um, but I think it can be handled carefully with, you, with your wording choice. You're right to point that. You need to be careful. Okay, we just had another question come in. Um, it says, how much prep do I need to set aside to implement? And Marie Claude, maybe I'll just flip this one to you right away. Did you have um, any anecdotes from your clinics in, in Quebec uh, on this point? Much preparation they had to do? Yeah. Well, actually, uh, because it was a, a pilot project, I would say that um, maybe uh, they uh, were learning all along. <laughs> So uh, I guess now they wish they could have prepped more before, and especially the filters. As I said, uh, 
they, none of the clinics we were working with uh, thought about it before, thought it truly, uh, thoroughly. So mm -hmm. um, uh, it, some problems occurred because of that. So you need to really uh, think fully about what type of um, exam, no, like uh, examinations you want to be put online, and you meet, need to be careful to put the right amount of time and to build your filter or your pop-up quiz or whatever the way you implement it, just to make sure that uh, it will uh, it will put the right patient in the right type of slot. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you'll end up having a lot of problems and. I think clinics wish wish they would have had more time doing this, or they would have they, they wish uh, they could have thought about it before. But mm -hmm. you can think about it when it's the first time it's a pilot project. So they were surprised about it. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it's a classic case of you you don't know what you don't know, um, and sometimes. Exactly figure it out along the way. Um, and that's what we're hoping some of the change management tools that I just mentioned will be able to help prompt the practices who are thinking about it um, to just even think about. Um, at a conceptual level, it seems like it's a simple thing, and I, I think it is, but it will go more smoothly when you actually put the prep work in it and get yourself ready and make sure you've thought about, you know, how is the phone still going to be managed? Who's doing that? How does it get booked into the EMR? And, and those kinds of things. Um, you know, integration may or may not be there. From our white paper, oh, I was just going to say one more thing that we heard a range of the time to implement, and uh, we have this kind of these uh, quotes in our white paper as well. Uh, but one physician said, you know, it took virtually no time at all to get the solution up and running. Uh, in that particular case, it was a standalone solution, and they were able to customize the rules easily. It was a smaller practice, um, and there wasn't a lot of training time for them to use it. Uh, whereas another multi provider practice, a little bit larger, um, said, you know, it was a, about three days and for two full-time staff. So that would be total time, thinking about the communication materials, um, how to staff. They kind of upstaffed a little bit for the first few days, uh, the training time, and also communication with equipment suppliers. So it, it wasn't like a total time, but it was little bits and pieces over there. But overall, it was about um, two staff and three days' worth of time. Yeah. So it's quite easy. It's fairly easy. Um, what I wanted to add is about the filtering or the, the pop-up quiz. Uh, you, sometimes um, it, it may happen that the pop-up quiz will answer at the end. You should, unfortunately, you should phone the secretary because it's kind of a dead end, and it's possible some particular cases may be difficult, and uh, these people may be routed to routed to the, the secretary still. The other thing I wanted to uh, mention was about uh, specialized clinics. When uh, when you need uh, um, a prescription from a general doctor, these uh, pose particular problems, and it may take a little bit more time because the workflow is different. You need to make sure that you receive the prescription from the general doctor, and so you have, again, additional filters, and so this may ask for more preparation. That's good, thank you. And that actually leads into another question that we had or addresses partly, um, could the use of filters be used to facilitate triaging? And I think, um, you know, absolutely that is the case. Um, it, there's quite a range of e-booking solutions out there and they all offer different functionalities. So it's something that you would want to consider as you were selecting your solution. Um, but in some cases, you can incorporate a little bit of a patient questionnaire or one, two, three questions um, to help the patient select the right appointment type, or perhaps it's linked to a specific appointment type that the patient gets booked into. Um, sometimes the appointments include the reason for visit as well. Um, so if on the back end, the practice clinician MOA uh, thinks that the patient has booked themselves into the wrong appointment type based on the reason, um, elect they can look at that at their own convenience as well and suggest rescheduling the appointment too. So it can kind of work from both ends. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have another question saying, is there any data on the volume of lost passwords? How frequently does this ex uh, is this experienced by patients? Um, I, ha I don't have a formal number myself on that, Marie Claude. I don't know if you um, did from this research study. Me neither, because this is a this is something that we're not we were not able to ask. Uh, it was too personal as a question, uh, and. Uh, 
we should, if we could, we would go back to these clinics and ask them because now uh, most of these clinics started using the system, uh, putting uh, online availabilities while we were conducting the study. So we, we didn't have we didn't have enough time to monitor these uh, behaviors. But uh, you can be sure that. I'm pretty sure that uh, these numbers for those who who uh, registered fairly quickly when they learned about the system but didn't have to book uh, uh, an appointment at the same time, these people will probably need to ask for their passwords. But we don't have these numbers uh, so far. Um, and then I can also just add to that um, that some of the solutions would allow a patient to reset their own password if they've forgotten it, similar to other online things that we do. Uh, so it can be managed at the time that a patient needs it quite easily without any intervention from the clinic. Um, and in other, other cases, we've also heard that anecdotally, some clinics with earlier versions of solutions did spend a little bit more time on the phone helping a patient as they got used to the online booking tool, but that, that was a transitional kind of thing and that, that angst or, or activity did go away with time um, as patients and then the clinic itself became more familiar with use of the solution. So it's like with anything, I think you can always experience you know, a few bumps along the way and this would be along those lines, but it's not a sustained kind of thing. Um, it's temporary, and then the overall benefit is still, you know, suggested to be worth the worth the effort, for sure. Um, uh, and what we heard is that it was worth it. I mean, the time that the secretary, some secretaries, spent with the patients, uh, helping them to use the system, it, it was worth it because after that they saw a big decrease in the phone calls they would receive. Perfect. So it was time well spent. Uh, we have another question here asking, how much time would a receptionist spend working with the e-booking system on a daily basis? And is there anything that they have to do once it's set up? Um, and I think it really depends on how each practice is set up already. Um, whoever is currently uh, booking appointments and managing the volume of that right now is typically the person who would be involved in the booking after. So uh, we use the term e-booking to... In uh, refer to the patient side of things, the patients booking the appointment themselves and trying to alleviate the burden on the staff from the scheduling aspect. So clinics already um, do schedule and manage the schedules for a practice and a number of clinics have electronic scheduling tools. So the person who's already managing that would be someone who would be involved somehow in the e-booking uh, solution as well. So there's typically a front end for the patient and a back end for the clinic or the administration of it. Um, and in the best scenario, um, both are using the same solution. Um, we have heard of some less ideal practices where um, patients were able to book online into a system which was not integrated with the clinic's electronic scheduler. So the clinician or whoever had to run to the front desk and let the person know that the appointment had been booked by somebody, which was inefficient in itself, but in several instances resulted in you know, someone else in that meantime had booked that same spot in person or on phone. Um, so there'd be double appointments showing up for the same time slot. So um, having coordination in practices is important. So typically, you know, the patients will book their appointments and that will um, automatically be handled by the system. If the rules are all in place, the system can automatically confirm the appointment back to the patient and there's not a lot of activity required from the clinic staff at that end. Uh, but there will still be the need to enter in somehow phone or um, in-person appointments into that same tool, ideally. And there you go. There's another question here asking if we know if the drop in the number of no-shows is related to e-booking or to reminders. Um, and Marie Claude, I'll ask you to jump in on this one as well, but I have a feeling it's um, it is double faceted. So I think the fact that a patient can book an appointment at the time um, that's convenient to them is, is hugely important. Um, we've heard some cases where, for example, a, patient, a parent has a child who's sick in the night and maybe at three, four in the morning they feel like, oh my gosh, I need to get an appointment with the doctor. They'll book an appointment, but by eight o'clock in the morning that child's better and they're not as uh, freaked out and tired, sleep deprived anymore, and they realize they can cancel that appointment. So they can automatically go online and manage that. That appointment becomes automatically available for someone else to book. So rather than them not showing up because the child's home and now sleeping, um, they're able to do it. So 
that access itself does help with managing the no-shows. The use of automated reminders, though, is also uh, um, linked to it, too. And I think it's a bit hard to tease them out. I don't know, Marie Claude, if you have anything to add to that. Uh, from our results, we were not able to uh, actually uh, say any, anything about that because it was one and the one and the same thing. It was the system that we were using, so we wouldn't be able to tell if it's the e-booking or the, the reminders because one is tied <coughs> to the other. I would also think, like you, that uh, the, e the the fact that you can, at first, take make your appointment when you know you can actually go to your appointment instead of uh, agreeing to the first slot that the secretary tells you and later on realizing that actually you can't go uh, or any other reason. And also being able to, because you make your appointment, but you can also modify, as you said, and, and uh, cancel your appointment online. And because I think this is one of the reasons why it is mostly uh, um, less uh, no shows with e-booking, but we wouldn't be able to uh, to devise like to to dichotomize between reminders and e-booking system because for us in our survey it was considered as one old system. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that, that's kind of my feeling on it too. And I think historically when we were doing the research for the white paper, um, I think there's a fair bit of data back to even when practices just started phone call reminders and stuff that that resulted in change. So then I think, you know, logically thinking about email reminders or text reminders or automated phone calls, you know, that certainly has the same kind of um, benefit. It's probably just more convenient. So when you match the two of them up, I, I think it's, um, you know, it's a double bang for your buck kind of thing. Um, we have a, another question here that says, um, if the doctor or the practice doesn't even use a desktop computer to track their patient's information, how is it possible to, to transition to e-booking? Um, and I'm glad you, that you asked that question because we certainly have seen uh, this successfully happen across the country already. Uh, so we do have paper-based practices that have successfully, I can't speak anymore, uh, implemented e-booking. Um, often the e-booking solution, as I mentioned, has the scheduling functionality or the administrative side as well as the front end for the patient. So it's possible for the practice to begin by creating their schedule online, uh, creating the rules and the filters that make sense for that practice, and then making it available for the patient. So in essence, it's, you know, as a first step, moving to electronic scheduling, even without integrating to an EMR. You don't necessarily have to have a computerized practice to be able to um, get this benefit for yourself as a practice or a clinician, um, as well as afford it to your patients. Think about it. Most of the time, you need to have at least your patient index, so it's the first step into, into EMR. So you need to yeah. build your patient index so that it, because these are, uh, considering, considering that most clinics don't accept new patients, only the, 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 uh, the patient of, of these clinics will be able to make appointments to those clinics, so they, they need to be in the system in the first place, even even before they they register. They need to be allowed to register, and so the patient index needs to be there, and this is always the first step in uh, adopting EMR. So this is uh, this is something that will be already done for the second the later step uh, with adopting an EMR. Yeah, that's a good point. It's a little bit of an early uh, readiness ass assessment to moving on to the bigger thing. That's a good point, a way of framing it. We have um, another question here saying um, that we mentioned better integration with EMR vendors is recommended. Is there any mandate to encourage EMR vendors to open up their system for integration? Um, and I think while we, we recognize that it's an ideal practice for integration, for everything to fit nicely together, there's, certain, uh, there's not a mandate at the moment to, um, to make this happen. Um, I think it will be, you know, come from consumer demand, um, and consumer in this case being, you know, clinicians and practices as well, um, need, making this need known um, for the the vendor uh, vendors to respond to the to this need and develop the solutions that way. There are some standalone solutions now that can integrate with EMRs, and there are some EMR solutions that have the modules already built within that can be turned on. Uh, so integration is happening right now, but there's no mandate at the moment. Yep. And uh, I'll put out a final call for any questions. I think we've come to the last in the queue. Mariko, do you have any parting thoughts then or, or comments to add before we wrap up today's session? 
No, I think that uh, it covered pretty much everything about your last uh, comment about the integration. To my knowledge, there uh, none of our EMRs in Quebec are uh, have a, a, an e-booking uh, module. Uh, okay. Although, as we said, as I said earlier, DDI is, is integrated with KinLogic. But it's integrated for the patient index. Uh, to my knowledge, it was not integrated with other um, functionalities that would allow uh, the type of expert system uh, that I uh, talked about earlier. So again, uh, I think it's uh, in the meantime a call to these providers just to think about maybe uh, the, uh, integrating an e-booking module in their uh, solution and think think it, think it through and trying to build it in a clever way so that it's inter fully integrated with the other functionalities in the first place, and not only with the patient index. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Well, as we wrap up then, we'd like to think about what's next. So we mentioned the e-booking initiative, and we still have Wave 2 open for registration, and registration is closing on Monday, December 15th. At this time, there's no plans to continue uh, funding for future waves of the e-booking initiative. Uh, I think we'd like to kind of take stock of where things are at and support uh, people that are currently in progress right now and make sure that we're getting the lessons learned and providing the right change management resources and support and letting the vendor marketplace get ready um, to respond to the needs from clinics and practices as well. So registration for this wave ends on Monday, December 15th at 3 p.m. If you are interested, please uh, get in touch and submit an application. Um, the links to do so are on the screen here. And as well, if you are interested um, in other kinds of consumer health uh, functionalities, we have more incentives for health care uh, teams to get connected. We have an eConnect Impact Challenge that has $1 million in awards for innovative healthcare providers who are connecting digitally with their patients or each other. Registration for the challenge is open until March 31st, so it's never too late to join. And then in closing, I just want to thank Marie Claude very much for her time and for sharing us the lessons learned from the six primary care practices in Quebec. It's nice to hear how others are actually doing and make it real instead of just so conceptual from the, the literature. Uh, so we thank you very much for your time and to all of you for your very good questions. I'm glad to see that you're thinking about it and wondering how you can move forward. And I hope today's session on the value and benefits and some of the common challenges um, provide you with thoughts on how to mitigate these concerns and how you can get going yourself. Again, we'll make this recording available online as well as the slides. It'll be on InfoWay's website and we invite you to get in touch with us after and keep in touch along the way. Thank you. Thank you.